Hey y'all, movie retrospective. Although on today's show, I think I didn't entirely realize, I mean, I kind of realized this when I put it in the poll. Um, when I put it in the poll, this was like, Shudder had just added it, so I was like really excited about it. So this is actually a series uh, from 1980, like a British TV series called Hammer House of Horror. So, I mean, I think I realized it was a series, but I didn't realize how long it was gonna take me to watch it because <laughs> There's 13 episodes, and each episode is, like, 52, 53 minutes. So this is essentially, like, 13 hours worth of entertainment. But I persevered. Uh, Tom didn't see all of them. No, I saw some of them. But uh, but I actually, like, watched all of them, like, over the course of a couple of days. And uh, I, don't, I thought that I had seen this when I was a kid, but a lot of it wasn't real familiar. So maybe it was another one I'm thinking, because I love horror anthologies. Um, and there were a lot of them like coming out around this time period and even like in the US and stuff like that I mean, obviously we have like the big hitters over here like Twilight Zone and we have one thriller Which I kind of feel like was that Boris Karloff? I don't know. I don't really want to say what that is But Remember I don't Night gallery. Yeah, and night gallery is actually I was just gonna say yeah. night gallery is actually one of my favorite and some of the Stories in this kind of reminded me of night gallery a little say. bit. Yeah, it is very night gallery esque um, but the thing about it though is that because it's Hammer, I think pretty much all of them are set in like, um, you know, the modern day or what was modern in 1980. They all have boobs too. And they they pre- all have They nudity. pretty much do. They pretty much Just all have. good. Now, they all have nudity in them. And now, now here, I'm gonna, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you guys, it's not the same epic nature of boob and boob- boobism that happened <laughs> in the Hammer movies. You know what I mean? Those girls were fucking off the charts. These are more kind of like, I would say, kind of B and C stringer type actresses. You know what I mean? You think? They, yeah, a lot of them. They were good looking, but they weren't like some of the knockouts from the movies. Well, I kind of feel like yeah. by 1980, um, I mean, Hammer came back yeah. like later on fairly recently, but I kind of feel like this was, um, you know, Hammer's kind of like last hurrah. Yeah. Was doing this series, uh, I think it was for ITV, which was like the yeah. rival to the BBC at the time. They're doing. They're trying to do what Hammer does. They're just doing. Yeah. They're doing it in a slightly updated fashion, and maybe they're trying to. Maybe they were kind of saying that those, uh, you know, fucking Victorian fucking bustiers and the fucking titties up around the ears and shit. I mean, oh, that was all passe. Oh, that's just too sexist. We can't have that anymore. Just take your clothes off. <laughs> well, I, don't I kind know. of feel like they were more trying. I think they were trying something different. Like yeah. we're just going to do something like modern. They were trying to modernize of, it a lot. Yeah. So, it, but still boobs because you know. Yeah, that's it kinda was kind of had a hippie was. vibe to it. Wasn't so '60s. It wasn't swinging '60s. Yeah. So it's very, very. I mean, it came out in 1980, like early 1980s. So this some is still witch, very '70s. They had a couple. They had that one. Uh, they had like some decent witches and shit in it. You know what I mean? That one witch episode was pretty good. Yeah, that was like the first one. It was like the first one. That was pretty good. Um, and interestingly, I think that I recognized, because I watched you know a lot of British movies and British TV and stuff back in the day, so I think I recognized every single motherfucking actor in yeah. this. Seriously. Every one of them made a shit ton of movies, too. They did, and every, like TV everything. shows. Yeah, and so it's just yeah. kind of like... So the whole experience of me watching this series was just kind of like, hey, it's yeah. that guy, and hey, it's that woman. They it's got just... the dude that played Dim from fucking uh, uh Yeah, Robert I couldn't Mark. believe I saw him. He yeah. was like in the second one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Denholm Elliott was in one, which yeah. is probably my favorite episode. He was actually the dad in Brimstone and Treacle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as well. But I he mean, was he, was a, he was in a fuck ton of... I mean, hired he was... dude to class up the joint all the time. You just have him around. <laughs> yeah, that dude was like the British version of Burgess Meredith. You just, you know, pull Burgess Meredith out, put him in the movie. <laughs> like I said, let him class up the joint. Yeah, let him class up the joint a little bit. But yeah, so these are these were cool because, I mean, obviously, just like with any anthology series, um, you're going to get some that are stronger than others. But these are all surprisingly decent. These were all really worth watching. I think there was like a couple uh, that were standouts. Um, but all of them were were pretty damn good. I'd put it on par with with um, Night Gallery, although Night Gallery was eerier, a lot weirder at certain times, but close. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, if you if you liked the Hammer horror movies, this is essentially like 13 short yeah. Hammer films, but set in the modern day. So they're not like kind of gothic, really. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of them had that sort of had gothic trappings to them yeah they didn't have the gothic look but yeah but most of them were kind of the were storytelling modern. was kind of goth 
kind of like got yeah because I think that like uh, some of the directors and writers it was it looked like pretty much the same pool I think most of them was just directed it was like three different dudes um, and they had done uh, you know some other Hammer movies in the past uh, I think one of them had done Satanic Rites of Dracula and one did like Dracula 80 1972 so you know so if you like like Hammer movies but want to see like a more modern take on them they still have a Hammer vibe but they're modern yeah. uh, and I kind of feel like you'll probably really dig this too if you're into like the Amicus yeah. uh, horror anthology movies because I really dig those yeah, as well. Yeah. I love like anthology type of stuff. So let's kind of go through all the episodes and when we get to ones that I think are the best ones then we'll talk like a little bit more about those. Yeah. I'm just off of, just from, right off the top from the very beginning they're, they're worth watching. Out of the two it, out of everything it reminds me mostly of Night Gallery but a British version of that I'd still have to give it to Night Gallery for just weirdness, though. Night Gallery was more intense, more weird. Yeah, I, th uh, I found Night Gallery, like, creepier. Real creepy, kind of, yeah. The girl that finds the damn... The, was it evil girl that was torturing the damn monster and putting rocks around it? That was a weird one. Remember that one? Yeah. And then the dude who had to live in the air conditioning. It's like in Florida. As soon as the air conditioner was gone, he fell apart. Well, that was based on a Lovecraft story. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. cool air. That's cool a very, air. That's a very yeah, famous that's a Lovecraft story. That's been adapted so, lots of times. Right. Yeah, this one was interesting because I don't think none of them seem to be like adaptations of other stories because I know that they had like another anthology. I think this was also a British anthology show, Tales of the Unexpected. And I think most of those were, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that most of those were adapted from like Roald Dahl stories. And I think that, well, even like Alfred Hitchcock Presents and shit like that in the US, I think they adapted like a bunch of Roald Dahl stories as well. Um, you know, and like like I said, like, you know, Twilight Zone and stuff, they adapted like a lot of stories by like Richard Matheson and Harlan Ellison and, you know, established short stories. These ones all looked like, at least from what I could determine, were all like original yeah. stories and were all kind of like written by some of the Hammer writers and directed by the Hammer directors. Yeah, I had to give a shout out to the Twilight Zone. Probably one of the best television series of all time. I rewatched Twilight Zone like every couple of yeah. years, like the whole series. Fuck, man. I mean, and some again, some of those were weird. Man. Some of them are better than others, yeah. but you're going to get that with any yeah, anthology with show. I mean, some of them know. were pretty just generic, but some of them were fucking really weird. Yeah. The thing yeah. about this one, uh, the thing about Hammer House of Horror is that I think it relied less on twist endings because I feel like Tales of the Unexpected or a lot of the stuff that was based on like Roald Dahl stuff was. Um, you know, kind of like, oh, there's like a twist ending. And some of these had twist endings. Some of them you can see coming. I'm thinking uh, in particular of one called Visitor from the Grave, which I think I saw that ending coming a mile away because that twist has been done a lot of times. But there was one episode in particular, which I'll talk about in a second, um, that went in a direction I really was not expecting. So uh, I thought that was kind of cool. But and not all of them had twists, really. So I kind of thought that was good. There was a, and there's kind of something for everybody. There's witches. There's like satanic cult. There's like a conspiracy theory, psychological horror type thing. There's doppelgangers. There's a werewolf one. You know, so there's you know there's kind of like a weird surrealist like dream nightmare thing. There's so there's kind of like I said something for everybody. Oh, and there's a serial killer one too. Um, so yeah, so the first one, which I think is one of the ones that you saw. Uh, is called Witching Time. This one, interestingly, uh, the witch is played by Patricia Quinn, probably most famous, well, not probably, absolutely most famous for playing Magenta in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So, uh, so she's in this one. And basically what happens is this dude named David, and I guess he's like a music, like he writes music for movies or something. And uh, so his wife is uh, cheating on him which he suspects but can't prove. And it, it actually turns out that she is fucking his psychiatrist or his psychologist who's played by Ian McCulloch who was in a bunch of Lucio Fulci movies. So again, you know, he was a British actor, but for Irish, Scottish, I don't remember. But he was uh, in a bunch of Lucio Fulci, like in a bunch of Italian horror movies. So his wife's dicking around and uh, on him, like jumping on the psychiatrist dick. Now, while he's home alone, a very weird thing happens. This strange woman, uh, Magenta, appears in his barn and claims that she is Lucinda Jessup and that she was being burned for a witch back in 16... Rah, 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 and uh, somehow used magic to, like, magic herself into the future to, like, escape uh, the flames, which, neat trick. So she is an actual witch. Uh, so at this point, it's good because... 
this one wasn't one of my favorites, but I kind of like that that had they started out with this one because I like old school witch shit. So she turns out to be like a super evil witch, but for a long time, because she can apparently like appear and disappear, because David like kind of locks her in a room as you would, because at first he thinks she's just a nutcase who turned up in his barn. Uh, and then he calls somebody else and then like she's disappeared from the locked room. So she can kind of like uh, disappear and appear at will. So for a long time, nobody else sees her. So everybody else thinks that David is just like losing his fucking marbles because he says like, for real, there's this witch that like popped up and like, and he can, she can like control him and stuff. So, so there's that whole situation uh, where this witch is like uh, tormenting him and also kind of like trying to get him to kill his unfaithful wife and like burn her at the stake instead for whatever purpose. But yeah, this one was a pretty decent one. Like I said, cool to see uh, Patricia Quinn in something else. I know she was in other things, but I mean, she's just so, she's magenta to me. So it's just like weird seeing her playing another part. And it's weird because she almost sounded like she had an American accent in this. And I was just like, oh, she's Irish though. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, it kind of sounded like a, like a thing. Now, the one with the twist that I was talking about that I didn't see coming is the second one. And this one's called The 13th Reunion. And this starts out with this woman named Ruth, and she's like a journalist, but she works <laughs> she works on a newspaper on like the women's page, and she's like really not happy about it because she's always just kind of like, why do I have to like read all these stupid fashion shows and shit like that? I want to write about something like important. So because her editor apparently thinks she is fat even though she absolutely is not and it's really weird they should have probably hired or at least put her in a fat suit or something because the first part of this they're like okay well there's this new weight loss clinic or like a health farm and there's been all these weird like um complaints about it because everybody's saying that they're super abusive and there's like but it works apparently but so they are gonna send this woman ruth like undercover to like go infiltrate this health farm and so but they make all these like the, literally the first thing she walks into her editor's office and the editor says you're overweight and i'm like is she though i mean she had a bulky sweater on but then when they showed her later on i'm like she is absolutely maybe she was like 70s overweight because she was like super skinny no it's just the 70s i guess so well, but no, what i'm saying is is you know it's just, it's just it, it was it's theater you're suspending disbelief <laughs> well because then it bothered me yeah. the whole time i'm like she is absolutely no. not fat by any They're pretend. definition These people pretend for a living back then and this, but they put her in bulky clothes at first yeah. but then later on she was just wearing normal shit and it, was I'm like like the so obviously... fat, it was like the so-called fat girl from greece she's obviously not fat she's just wearing fucking big bulky clothes yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of like... Then they show her in the last scene and she's skinny. Well, she always looked like that. Yeah, it's like they were just kind of like punched her out. <laughs> yeah, they were like, just trying to make you believe it. That's kind of what they did here. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that she infiltrates this, uh, this health farm or this weight loss clinic. And the first thing, like she goes to this meeting and there's this dude and he's just berating this woman, like telling her what a fat cow she is and how her, she's disgusting tough love. and all this other kind of it's stuff. Tough love. And uh, so Ruth is just kind of like, huh, well, this is weird. Now she ends up meeting this other dude who is also at the house, who's played by the same guy that played uh, Dim in A Clockwork Orange. Like I said, yeah. this is the only other thing I had seen him in too, yeah. even though he's been in a shit ton of stuff, but that's probably what he's most famous for. So she finds out that like, He's he's allowed because she's not allowed to eat because they're like, all right, you fat pig, like you have to eat just like lettuce and nothing, <laughs> lettuce and cigarettes. That's like the 70s diet and cocaine. Um, but he's allowed to like eat all the potatoes he wants and all this other stuff. And they said, well, they you know, it's different for everybody else, for everybody. Um, so he's just allowed to eat all this fattening shit. But then it turns out that. Uh, the guy, Dim, even, his character's name is Ben, okay. But he dies in a car accident. And after that, Ruth hooks up with this kid, well, like a guy, like a young guy that works at the mortuary. And he's like, you know, I think that like the two guys that run the mortuary, I think they're doing some shady shit, like with some of the bodies that yeah. turn up at this mortuary. And um, so she's like, ooh, it's a real story. Like, instead of, like, all the stupid weight loss shit she usually writes. So she, so her, she starts playing, like, Nancy Drew around the shit and uh, trying to find out what these two dudes are doing with these occasional bodies that they're spiriting away somewhere. And um, this one was good because this one, 
like I said, it was it was an adventure, this one, um, because I had no idea like where it was going. I was just like, what's with this weight loss clinic? And then I thought it was going to go. Remember that creep show episode where they made them eat those parasites that yeah. like could take all that weight off? I yeah. thought it was going to go in that direction. That's not the direction it goes in. I just really was not expecting it. I don't really want to spoil it because I don't know if a lot of Americans have seen Hammer right. House of Horror and Shudder just added it. You can also watch it, I think, on Tubi and Pluto for free, maybe. But Shudder just added it, too. It's, like, in their yeah. little series tab. But uh, So I don't really want to say, like, where this went because I didn't expect it. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay, fair enough. That That's kind of cool. Now, the third one, I think this was my favorite. This was the one with Denholm Elliott in it. Uh, this one was called Rude Awakening. This one I really liked because I really liked that it was kind of like a nightmare, like, all the way through. Uh, and it had kind of, I don't want to say it had a David Lynchian vibe, but it did kind of have that whole like dream and you don't really know like what's a dream and what's reality. So Denholm Elliott, he plays this dude named Norman and he's like a real estate agent and he has this office and he has like this hot secretary and at the beginning of it, like this dude comes in and says, Hey, I have this like big property that I want, you know, take it off my hands. He's just, he doesn't own it or whatever. And so Norman goes there and it's like this big, it's a massive like mansion or whatever, but it's like a shithole. It's like really in a horrible like condition. And so, so you kind of establish that. You establish that this older guy is having an affair with his secretary, his name is Lolly. And she's um, younger. And younger. she's way younger. She's yeah. like his daughter's age, maybe his granddaughter's age. I'm not really sure. Maybe not. But um, she it's looks funny. familiar. He gets it behind her. She's sitting at the desk. He puts her in and just grabs her. And just grabs her. And dude walks in. He's like, oh, sorry. It's funny. <laughs> that wasn't what I looked like. I was massaging. Yeah, he was doing massage. like Steven Seagal, like he was testing yeah, her for yeah. breast cancer. Just him checking for breast cancer. Yeah, he's. <laughs> Chicken, doing shiatsu, special shiatsu. No, don't give me. <laughs> don't get me started on that. Yeah. Tom, stop talking about me. <laughs> this isn't even about me. I'm not even in this movie. Yeah, not in this movie. <laughs> but yeah, so he also has uh, a wife named Emily who he is kind of planning to get rid of. Now, it's kind of cool how this one goes on too because... Each time, like, what ends up happening is that he goes to this weird house, like, out in the middle of nowhere, and he's looking at it, and then, like I said, it's really creepy and dilapidated or whatever, and then this dumbwaiter thing opens, and, like, his wife's body falls out of it, and then he keeps hearing these disembodied voices saying, like, why did you kill your wife? Why did you kill your wife? And he's like, what the fuck? And then, like, he wakes up, and that was actually a nightmare. But then, it, as it goes on, he keeps thinking that he woke up from a nightmare, but every single subsequent thing also turns out to be a nightmare. And it's like funny because Lolly, his secretary, looks different like in every iteration. Like she has a different colored hair. She has a different colored outfit on. Like in one iteration, she actually kind of looked like some fucking Xanadu, like Olivia Newton-John. Like she had like a big blonde Afro-y kind of thing and like this crazy red spandex something that you would never wear to work like in a million years but because it was like a dream of his um you know but he kept but he keeps hearing these voices and like getting phone calls saying like why did you kill your wife and all this other stuff and then like you so you don't actually know what's really going on and what he's just dreaming uh until the end and i really really liked this one i think this one and spoiler alert the one with peter cushing uh, were my favorite ones. I think those were the two strongest ones. And from the few reviews of this that I saw, that seems to be, like, the pretty prevailing attitude. Although I think that, like, I don't know, it's kind of all over the map, like, which ones people liked. But I think this one and the Peter Cushing one um, kind of come up as most people's favorites. Um, the next one is called Growing Pains. And that one, this one was pretty good. It was just, like, about a kid who, his dad is, like, a scientist, and he was trying to grow plants that have protein in them i was like oh he was way ahead of his time wasn't he um you know for the third world like to feed the hungry and everything like that and his son ends up just casually walking through his lab one day and just swallowing a bunch of shit that was like in a jar like as one does uh and it kills him and so they adopt another kid like who's the same age like from an orphanage and the kid is like super weird and then you think that it's kind of going in an evil kid direction which it kind of does but there's also some supernatural shit going on too like with the the ghost of the first kid so this one was pretty good too like i said this one was kind of i've seen other stories like this so this one wasn't like super original but you know still worth watching uh the next one was the house that bled to death and that was one where, which is a great title, by the way. 
Um, that one's like a couple, and they move into this kind of shitty council house or whatever with their daughter. And I guess there'd been like a murder there before, but they didn't know that. And then this one had a twist too that also I didn't see coming. Um, and I actually kind of liked the twist on this one. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but all this like supernatural shit starts happening. Like the pipes bust open and blood comes out and you know, just poltergeisty type shit uh, starts going on. And uh, they start blaming the neighbor because I guess like the poltergeist shit only happens like when the neighbor is there and all this other stuff. Um, so yeah, this one was pretty good too. And like I said, also has a twist at the end that I didn't really see coming, but I actually did like the twist of this one. The next one is called Charlie Boy. And this one was kind of like a voodoo-y type story. Uh, had kind of an African fetish, kind of like trilogy of terror type situation where this couple they buy uh, like at an antique sale or estate sale or whatever, this sort of like African voodoo fetishy thing. And um, so the guy, like one night he jokingly, he gets into this, this road rage incident, like this, and this dude, he's like a gangster or whatever. And then he gets so mad about it that he's like, man, I wish I could kill that dude or whatever. And then like he stabs the, the statue. And then so then like a voodoo curse is like set into motion uh, so this, so it's kind of like a, basically, and this one doesn't really have a twist. It kind of just goes on like to its logical conclusion. Like, you know, he's like, Hey, this voodoo shit actually works, but you know, it ends up kind of like biting him in the ass in the end. So again, that one, uh, pretty decent. The next one is the one that most people point to as their favorite. And this is easily one of the standout ones. It's called the silent scream. And this has uh, Peter Cushing in it and Brian Cox, uh, who was in, fuck tons of British stuff. I mean, he is super, super recognizable. And he was in like from the Indiana Jones movies, stuff like that. So, uh, so yeah. So Brian Cox plays this dude named Chuck and he was in prison for two years for robbery. I guess he was like a safe cracker. And while he was in there, Peter Cushing, who plays this dude named Martin Bluick, uh, like a German fella, he has been uh, counseling him and like giving him money and stuff like that while he's in prison. And so once Chuck gets out, he goes back to Martin's uh, pet shop to thank him. And he's like, well, okay, well, I'm going to give you a job, like, until you can get a better one, because I know you got out of prison and everything's rough and, and stuff. So he gives him this job. Apparently, Martin has, in the back or basement of his pet shop, he's doing these experiments with wild animals. So he has, like, panthers and tigers. and I don't know about tigers, but there's, like, panthers and all kind of, like, dangerous big cats and shit in there. And he's like, I'm trying to condition these animals to not need cages, like to not attack me. So he's basically using like operant conditioning type of thing where he electrocutes the fe the gates or like the, you know, the doors. And he uh, has also conditioned them to like only eat, even though he puts food in front of them, like they only eat like when he makes a certain sound. So he's doing like conditioning. And uh, it will probably surprise no one to know that he also wants to try this shit out on people. And um, because Chuck does something that he probably shouldn't do, he ends up getting trapped in this essentially like cage or like a, you know, a cell. Uh, and he starts to get conditioned as well because, and then it turns out too, that spoiler alert, Peter Cushing's character uh, who had told Chuck, he's like, yeah, I know all about, you know, prison and everything like that because I was in the concentration camps. Turns out he was a guard and <laughs> not a prisoner. Yeah. So he's like doing all these experiments with people to like see if they could be conditioned the same way that animals can be conditioned uh, using electri uh, electricity and things like that. This one was a really, really good one. I mean, the acting, Peter Cushing and Brian Cox, it's really great. I think this is the only thing they did together, but this was, and Peter Cushing, this was pretty late, like, he's pretty old in this, but the two of them are just fantastic in this, and it's just, it's such a great premise, um, and it's just, like, I don't know, I really like the way this one goes, and this one has a really, like, nasty ending, and I really didn't expect it to end that, like that, like, I thought everything was gonna work itself out, uh, but it didn't, um, so yeah, I really like this one, and like I said, this one, a lot of reviews that I said were, like, um, that I saw, said this one, you could probably, because you can buy this like on DVD and Blu-ray and shit like that, obviously nowadays. Um, but they, a lot of people said this one's like just worth the price of admission, like all by itself. And I think I would agree with that. But like I said, this one and uh, Rude Awakening are easily my favorites. I mean, just the acting is great. The premise is great. It's just like fucking great. Uh, the next one, Children of the Full Moon. This is a werewolf one, which you'll be able to figure out pretty uh, early on. This one actually stars 
Diana Doors, she, if you don't know anything about British culture or anything like that, she was like the British Marilyn Monroe. She was like the blonde bombshell, you know, back, she looked a lot like Marilyn Monroe. Actually, she looked more like, uh, what's, who's the other one? The, uh, uh-huh. shit, man. Ah, God damn it. What's her name? What's her name? I'll think Jane of Mansfield. No, Mamie Van Dorn. Mamie, Mamie Van Dorn. Okay, she Van actually Dorn. reminds me a little bit Hotter. of Mamie Van Dorn. Hotter than fucking uh, Monroe. I didn't, I didn't see anything in Marilyn Monroe. Mamie Van Doren had, like, bigger boobies. Yeah, yeah. she was a lot harder. Way, way bigger boobies. <laughs> but she, yeah, yeah. so Diana Doris was kind of like, the. she looked a lot like Mamie Van Doren yeah. in the 50s. And then um, I didn't actually recognize her. for Well, I recognized her face. I was like, God, her face looks so familiar. I mean, she was obviously much, much older in this one. And this was actually uh, 1980. I think that was only, like, four years before she died. But uh, she kind of plays this creepy old woman there's like this couple and they're going out uh, i think it's somerset or whatever and they're going out on holiday and their car wrecks and they end up at this like really remote farmhouse and diana doors plays this kind of like overly friendly but like super creepy like matronly woman and she has this whole gaggle of children who she says are not all hers. Like, some of them are, like, foster, and, like, some of them are spe- stepkids and stuff. And it's just, the whole situation is just, like, really, really creepy, and you're not entirely sure what's going on. Um, but, like I said, I was, this one, it's not really a twist, because they establish pretty early on that there's some, like, werewolf action going on. So, um, but I like this, at the middle of it, it's almost kind of like they you think they get away because... Uh, the the couple are like, oh, something bad happened, and then, you know, but then later, the guy wakes up in the hospital, and they're like, oh, we were just in a car crash, so they, for a while, they think the whole werewolf shit was like a dream, which I thought was kind of cool, so there was, like, ambiguity for a while over whether the werewolf shit really happened or not, but yeah, it's definitely a werewolf story, so yeah, that was also a good one. The next one uh, is Carpathian Eagle. This is a serial killer one. Uh, This is basically about... All these dudes keep turning up dead with their hearts cut out, Um, you know, so the cops are just kind of like, okay, well, serial killer. So while they're investigating, they go to this woman who is writing a book about, essentially, it was kind of like a Countess Bathory type of of woman, like 300 years ago, she had cut, like, she killed like 107 dudes, like, cutting their hearts out. So they think that somebody knew about that and so they're doing a copycat type thing like 300 years later, even though it's apparently not a real well-known story. So they, so they go to this woman that's writing a book about it, and then they go to this, like, other, this older woman who's like a descendant of the Countess, and they're kind of like investigating all of that situation. And um, I don't really want to spoil this one either, although I saw where this was going about halfway through. Like, I'd figured out who the killer was. Um, so... I don't know. Your mileage may vary. I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna spoil it. But I figured out who the killer was. Now, interestingly, on the Wikipedia page and everywhere else, they have the 11th episode listed as "Visitor from the Grave." But on Shutter, "Visitor from the Grave" is the last episode. That's like the 13th one. I think this might have been my least favorite. Maybe just because one, you could see where it was going. Um, two, the woman that played, she's like an American heiress or something, and she's like in the UK. And this dude breaks into her house, like, while her husband is away, or her boyfriend, and is saying, like, oh, your boyfriend owes me money or whatever, and I'm just going to, like, take it out of your vagina. Like, so he tries to, like, rape her, and she straight up shoots him in the face, like, with a shotgun. And then she gets, like, really super hysterical about it and then just sees the dude everywhere. So, like, the dude is, like, haunting her. Um, And she's, because she was mentally unstable to start with. Um, pretty much, like, as soon as you know that she's, like, an heiress and has a shit ton of money, you can pretty much see, and I don't feel bad about spoiling this one, because, like I said, I've seen a lot of stories like this. Um, basically, the whole thing was a setup. Like, she didn't really shoot that dude. It was all, and her boyfriend and the dude that she shot and this psychic and this, like, in, like quote-unquote Indian Swami medium, they were all, like, in on it, like, to get her to blow her head off or get committed or whatever so they could take all her money. But... It's still good. I think this was like, but look, I think it was my least favorite one. One, just because it was a little bit predictable. And two, because the woman that played the American heiress was just like way over the top, like with the hysterics. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's, but it was good otherwise. Like it had some like creepy shit going on. Two Faces of Evil. These two, these last two were like some of the weirdest ones. Two Faces of Evil is essentially like a doppelganger story where there's this family and they're going on holiday again and they're out in this car and there's like a rainstorm and they pick up 
this dude that's like wearing a yellow raincoat and a yellow hat like he looks like the Gorton's fisherman and you can't really and you can't really see his face and pretty much immediately as soon as he gets in the car he attacks the dad um and they run off the road the car flips over and then everybody's in the hospital but later on like the mom and the kid aren't really hurt but the dad apparently he had like some glass from windshield like went into his throat or something so he can't talk and then so they take the dad home and then he starts acting really weird and like the mom starts becoming convinced that the dude in the raincoat and her husband are like had switch player one of them was a doppelganger you know what i mean the, like the husband looked like her husband but wasn't really her husband so that was because i wasn't really sure i didn't know that it was about doppelgangers at first so i was just sitting there going like wait what the fuck is going on but they they kind of established it but it takes a while like for it to know that it's about doppelgangers but this one was a pretty good one too i think although i think this was like my second least favorite um, and then the last one, although it's the 11th one, if you're watching it on Shudder, uh, this one's called The Mark of Satan. And if you're into like numerology, not numerology, but like conspiracy theories or stuff like that, this one was actually pretty good because this is a dude and he's, um, he works in a mortuary and he becomes obsessed with like, there's this p patient that's brought in and I think he was like a neurosurgeon and he had apparently tried to drill into his head with, you know, with a drill um to let the devil out or a demon or something because well, like girl tried dead on down and filmed it remember that yeah 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 she took that acid and fucking drilled it down through her third eye that was weird shit man people were fucking tripping back in the day yeah i know yeah. so man i don't know when did that happen 70s so maybe that's where they got the idea yeah, of like 70s. for the start of this late 60s or yeah 70s, something like that so, so he tried to drill into his own head, and he doesn't kill himself right away, but then, like, the other doctors, like, try to save him, but they're not able to. And the last thing he says before he dies is, leave my soul alone. So the guy that works at the mortuary becomes obsessed with this case, and he starts to become obsessed with the number nine, because, like, and people say it, and he's just like, oh, my God, it means something. Number nine? Yeah, that's number what I, I was thinking that that's the whole time I was watching that. that shit from. And, um, yeah, and so he, so he starts to become convinced that there's almost kind of like, I don't know if it's so much like the devil or it's like the devil in the form of a virus. And he thinks that there's, like, this conspiracy, that, like, everyone's in on it, and they gave him this evil virus um, to do something i'm not sure what i'm not entirely sure what the end game is but so this dude like he thinks that there's um weather vanes like he every time he looks up at a weather vane like he hears like radio static like in his head like something's like communicating with him and stuff so yeah. it's kind of like he has like schizophrenia or something like that but and then he's so so everybody he thinks everybody's in on this conspiracy to give him this evil virus for whatever reason because he's an, an innocent person or whatever he has this really horrible mother um, who he ends up killing and, you know, good riddance. But, um, and he also has this woman who lives in his building and then it ends up like she helps him hide the body. And then this is another one too, where you're not entirely sure whether he's just like paranoid or whether there is this cabal of people like Satanists something or other that are trying to like get into his brain somehow and getting him to eat a baby. Cause that's in there too. Um, you know, so just who, who wouldn't want a, somebody to eat a baby but yeah he's trying to like get him to do that and then there's like halfway through you're kind of just like he's like oh no i'm fine now uh i was just being paranoid i had a i had a moment and they fixed it but then you're not entirely sure but yeah so as i said if you're really into anthology horror um you know and if you've watched this because like i said i feel like maybe a lot of people have watched it recently because shutter just added it but if you don't have shutter but you should get shutter but if you don't then i think you can watch it on pluto for free and you might be able to watch it on tubi for free i'm not entirely sure but these are all like these are all really good they're all really worth watching like i said it's like 13 sort of short hammer movies there i think the shortest one is like 45 minutes and the longest one is like 53 minutes um, you know, like I said, some of them are better than others. Uh, I think that The Silent Scream is the best one. And The Silent Scream and um, Rude Awakening are like kind of tied for my favorites out of the series. But they're all pretty decent. There was none of them that I would have been like, oh, well, that was a waste of time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would say it was about on par with Night, Night Gallery. Yeah, so especially if you like Night Gallery or anything or Thriller or any of those type of things. Or if you like like the Amicus 
uh, movies, then you would probably like really dig this. Like yeah. some of like I know that some people thought like because I looked at a lot of the Shutter comments, um, and it was either kind of like everybody loved it, or there was a, a couple that were probably like younger, and they were just probably like yeah. these are so boring and slow. Um, but you know, a lot of the stuff from that era was. They yeah. they took a while to like establish because these are essentially like mini movies. They're like an hour long, right? So they need to like do some character development. Um, and I like that they kind of did. Some of them were supernatural. Some of them weren't supernatural. Some of them were kind of like surrealism or dreamlike, and some of them were kind of more prosaic. So they kind of like I said had something for everybody. Uh, kind of happy that there wasn't a vampire one. I have to say, there was a werewolf one and there was a witch one, but yeah. Maybe even back then, vampires are like, yeah, we're sick of vampires. We're Hammer. We're not doing any fucking vampires, okay? <laughs> that's, I know that's kind of our thing. But yeah, so like I said, if you're into horror anthologies, then it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, I'd be interested, because I know we have a lot of British listeners, to know if you guys saw this when you were kids or you know if you saw it later on and what you thought about it. Like I said, everybody in this. Oh, I forgot to mention too that the one with the serial killer, uh the Carpathian Eagle one, had an appearance by a very very young Pierce Brosnan. He was he was actually kind of one of the victims. He was only in it for like 2 minutes or something. He had a couple of lines, but I was like watching it. I was like, "Holy shit, that's Pierce Brosnan." But now I think he was in I think he was in that British movie, wasn't he in The Long Good Friday? But I can't remember if that came out before this or after this. So this might have been like his first big like role, maybe, even though he was only in it for like two minutes. But yeah, if, if you know anything about British cinema or British TV or anything like that, everybody in this is familiar. Mm. Um, and it's just like crazy. And even me, I'm not from the UK, but it's like I've seen a lot of the of movies and TV from over there. So I recognize pretty much everybody. Uh, but yeah, so I think I was most excited to see Magenta and see Dim. Because th those are the only times I've seen them, and it was cool to like see them in something else. But yeah, definitely uh, check this out. It's a lot of fun. And uh, let us know what you thought about it in the comments. And uh, we will see you guys on the next movie retrospective. Bye.